Welcome to Skippable News, where you can skip to the parts you want by going to the menu in the description below, or via the progress bar. Watching at home on a television via Suddenlink Channel 3. What? What? Yes, Channel Jimmy. Channel 3 is coming back to Suddenlink. And Skippable News, as well as Outside TV, is going to be airing there, as well as some new original programming that Laughing Parrot and uh, Sear Wave are going to be putting together. So if you are watching at home on Channel 3, then it'll be welcome to non-skippable news. I'm Jason Brown. I'm Jimmy T. And here are July 15th interviews. Uh, we have KT Gadero. She wrote the book Donkey Wolf. Chris Langley interviewed her. We also have Michael Prather, another Great, Chris Langley interview. They talk about the dry lake down in Owens, the Owens Dry Lake, and the birds that are there. Quite a few other things they talk about. We have Terrence Vestal. He's from the Enyo Register. Some of you might have already heard that on the uh, radio. If you have, then that's one you might want to skip. Uh, not that Terrence is bad, it's just they've heard it already. I love Terrence. Summer um, reruns. Summer reruns. We have Jeff Gabriel for uh, Eastern Seer Interpretive Association talking about the Summer Campfire series. That's great. We're squeezing in a moment with Howard and Arlene. It's a documentary about the Bishop Twin Theater. We're going to start showing those here as well. They are older ones. If you want to see the newer ones, you need to go watch the movies early at Bishop Twin Theater. We have Fred Rowe with the Fly Fishing Report, and we have Jimmy back. Jimmy was gone for two weeks with COVID and two weeks to go see his mom. Jimmy, how are you? I'm excellent. Thank you for asking, and uh, I don't recommend COVID. No, and it sucks, doesn't it? Call your mom, call your dad, or go see them. All right, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment on this video for a chance to win movie tickets to the Free. Bishop Twin Theater. Free. Talking about Bishop Twin Theater, uh, they have Love and Thunder from Thor held over, as well as the new movie, Elvis. What? Elvis? 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 Yes, Elvis. A lot of people I know are looking forward to that. Don't also forget that they have the Kids Summer Program, which is on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon and 2. This week they have Zathura. They have uh, Open Season 1. Hotel Transylvania 2, and are you ready for it? They have Jumanji, the original, not the original with Robin Williams, but the original remake from 2017. Okay, always go to bishoptwintheater.com to make sure that the information that we shared with you is accurate because sometimes it might change. And don't forget, like we said, like, subscribe, and comment for your chance to win movie tickets to the Bishop Twin Theater. Uh, we have a packed show. We're going to put it on autopilot. Jimmy and Jason here. We will see you next week. The author, the author's name is K.T. Gadero. That's her writer's name, but I'm going to call her Katie because that's how I've always known her. So, uh, so hi. hi. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Excellent. So we're going to talk about the book. I, I kind of wanted to to get into why you wrote the book. How did it come about? Well, it came about because I'm a was an early childhood educator educator at the time I taught preschool for many years, Matt Whitney Preschool. It was located inside um, Loeno Elementary School. I remember that. And Frankie Diaz and I were hanging out for quite a few years before we actually got married. And uh, he had this idea for a children's book that he wrote a synopsis for in 1997. <clears throat> and because I was an early childhood educator and had a lot of children's books of my own to read to my class, he gave the synopsis to me and thought I would be a, the right one to write it. And from reading it, you were. I, I, you know, I don't know what he gave you, what the synopsis actually was like, but it really feels like a, a, a legitimate Shoshone folktale. I don't know if it is. I don't know before he heard it or how he he developed it but it was really a very interesting it has a, a the the writing has a wonderful tone to it a rhythm um that i think is very special um so congratulations on that and you um also illustrated it and we'll talk about that in a little while i think that illustrations one of them at least will be behind us um as we speak what do you think is the, what, what did you like about the story that really caught your interest? Well, it's kind of a metaphor. Um, Native Americans like to tell stories and they pass down the stories through generation. And in the story, the three English sparrows uh, that need to escape from the mining camp, they think they're the last three left. 
Maybe you should explain that a little more. Okay. Um, um, a lot of people probably know about uh, canaries in the mine, but well, this is slightly in, different. Yeah, in this story, the, the English sparrows were brought over from England in the big wooden boat, because the story takes place in the 1880s. It starts out at the Cerro Gordo mine, and they were brought to um, the mines to in the same way to be used in the same way as the canaries were to detect the deadly gases um, if the sparrows died in the mines then the miners knew that the air was bad and they had to get out not a great job to have no <laughs> let's say so um, all these, these now people. did did uh, Frankie tell you that part of the story of the English on in, the big boat I it, mean the English sparrows on the, the big boat okay we, we discussed it too. So. I bet you did. Okay. So um, is that what, what caught your interest about it, it, that you would want to write a book? That's a story that um, it had a, the feel of the Native Americans passing their stories down for generations and the fact that the Native the sparrows wanted to find the other sparrows so they could pass their stories down. In, in reality, uh, just about a year ago, I was reading something on the internet that there is a species of birds in this world that was becoming extinct, and they had were losing their their songs because they didn't have others to teach them to. Mm. And that sounds a little I, bit like language in the yeah. indigenous population. And I didn't know this when I wrote the book, and mm. then I find out that it can be a true thing. So I was like, wow. Yeah, preserving indigenous uh, languages yes. are suddenly we're really focused on that, but it's very difficult if all the people who spoke it best are gone. Then what do you do? Yes, so, so. it's very important. Yeah, so. and you have lots of animals who sort of represent different things. I suspect, mm -hmm. is that true? Do you think? Oh yes. Yeah, and did you was that in the synopsis too? The, yes. the bear and the the characters. Well, Frankie had thought of the characters and given them names. I came up with the character of my own, which is um, Big Pouch the Pelican. Who stands out, has a very nice portrait. He, he has a very important part in this book, too. Hi, Chris Langley here, and I am with Michael Prather, who I have known for 50 years, because we're coming up to 50 years in the Owens Valley. Yep. And we taught together for 20 Mm -hmm. 20 plus years mm -hmm. in rooms at Lo Inyo. So I've known him for a long, long time. We've traveled together and he is one of the smartest guys when it comes to the Owens Valley, but particularly to the Owens Lake. So we're going to focus on the Owens Lake today and he is going to tell us what it's like and encourage us hopefully to go out and see what it's like. That's right. Right. So what is it like? You go out on the lake. I've been out there many times with you. What, what would they, pe people see? Why would they be wanting to go out there? Well, I, I think the main reason is, is that it's, it's a phenomenal place in terms of uh, just open, giant, empty space. And uh, once again, it has water. It doesn't necessarily look like a lake and that the water is compartmentalized in little cells to control dust. But it has created habitat and created the largest wildlife location in all of Inyo County. And we'll talk about some of yeah. that. Um, yeah. Some of the, the um, designations that Scott achieved, I guess, with yeah. help from people yeah. like you. Yeah, I mean, if people would like to see thousands and thousands of migrating birds of great beauty and wonder, um, and not have it on our television, but live. Uh, it's right down the road at, at Owens Lake. It always reminds me of somewhere else in the universe. It seems un unworldly in a, one mm -hmm. sense. It's so startlingly beautiful and stark. I recommend coming either at sunrise or at sunset. Yeah, it's a very peaceful place right, as well. Right, right. The length of the, you know, the low light, uh, the filtering of the atmosphere and the, you know, bringing colors out is always good. In the warmer months, the, the morning is definitely better. Um, but the birds are there, you know, seasonally, the, 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 the big numbers of birds. 
Um, and I, I look at March, April, and August through October as, as uh, times when people can just go out and just see clouds of birds. Yeah. Um, and a flamingo. I have a, and I have a photograph of that flamingo. <laughs> I, I, I saw him and I was, I thought that poor guy is really all by himself. It was alone. Standing on one leg with yeah. his head tucked in. Yeah. It, was, it was being a it flamingo. Was sad. It's a lot probably came from some zoo or golf course. Or, right. You know, exotic bird uh, uh, area or something. Take us for, for a kind of a, a what it was. The, the geological history of it, not in too much depth, mm -hmm. but, but just how, how it got and then where are we today? Yeah. And then where, where might we end up in the future with the lake? Well, well the, lake, the lake is currently, a, it's a terminal lake. It's, it's a, in geology, that's a, those are lakes where rivers come and end. Um, the water evaporates, all the minerals stay, so. It's a, it's a lake uh, that, uh, that is very common in the American West. There's Great Salt Lake, there's Mono Lake, there's a host of lakes around. Um, in the past, it's changed through time. It's gotten larger, it's gotten smaller. Uh, in the past, I'm talking about um, uh, thousands of years, you know, ice age times when, when there was a mile of ice on the Sierra and raging rivers down every canyon, um, the lake was 300 feet deep. It went all wow. the way north of Independence. Um, water went from Mono Lake to Owens Lake to Cyril's Lake at Ridgecrest, over to uh, Trona, uh, excuse me, not Cyril's Lake, China Lake, Cyril's Lake, and then Panamint Valley, and then into Death Valley. And they were all connected. They were all connected. They were fresh water. There were fish. There were mus mussels and and snails, we can, you know, we know, we can visit those beaches and find those remnants and put it together. So the lake has gotten larger and smaller over time. When settlers came, it was no longer an overflowing lake. It was a, it was a terminal lake. Um, it was terminal and kind of put out of its misery when Los Angeles came to the valley, uh, early 1900s. Uh, eventually in 1913, diverted the Owens River at Aberdeen, north of Independence. And uh, the river went dry, 62 miles of it, and the lake slowly went away. And so this massive wildlife heritage of California uh, was gone, virtually gone. Um, so later, when the lake turned into, after 80 years of choking on dust, um, the Clean Air Act uh, required Los Angeles to fix the dust. And so water was one of its uh, tools, because it's fast and it works. And um, it's painful, but it works. And that brought the birds back because it, it recreated the food web, very primitive, simple, very few moving part food web. And the, the table was set and the birds were back. Um, and I mean, they were back in enormous numbers. So, there's, so as they had been at one time. But as they had been. Up. So in, a, in an era of just tragic doom news, in terms of the environment. Um, Owens Lake represents uh, some good news. It's where something happened, albeit accidentally. It was a dust project that morphed into a uh, dust and habitat project, wildlife project. I, I, um, I remember when the, the, the discovery, I don't know if discovery is the right word, but when you began to realize that it was a win-win, and you said it was astounding at one of the meetings you went to because everyone became very civil with each other <laughs> when you realized both sides would benefit from it. So. Well, I, I worked a lot as an advocate with the Audubon Society. So we, we work on, on, on wildlife and habitat in general, but we've always had a good focus on birds. And, um, and, and that is true. Uh, when we approached uh, Los Angeles at meetings with the idea that we're, we realize how much water they're using and that it is painful for them. Um, you know, 65,000 acre feet of water a year going out there. Of course, that's where it all went originally, but um, we accepted and tried to understand their suffering. Um, and we would be willing to try to help them with efficiency and possibly use less. 
as long as they would commit to protect habitat and those birds. Um, that's when things started rolling. That, that was um, uh, the big compromise, uh, the basic bargain. And, uh, and so we've been moving ever since. It's, it's slow uh, because there's lots of people involved. You know, the State Lands Commission owns the lake for the people of California. Um, the uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Agency in California oversees the wildlife. Audubon tries to keep an eye on all of them. DWP does the dust, dust project. Um, it's a wondrous, it's a wondrous thing. It's getting more and more visitors, uh, definitely birders, okay. because it's known throughout the country and the world uh, for birds. And so many, many more people are going there for birds and some are just regular type people that have seen programming, um, that have uh, read stories in magazines, newspapers and things, that realize you know, this Owen Getty kind of place that's, that's out there now in Southern Owens Valley. Oh, good. Because uh, every time I've been out there, it's pretty deserted. So <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. It, you know, I know there's a map Mm -hmm. um, and a brochure, and so the information is out there. But... Right. Yeah, the uh, Department of Water and Power, um, City of Los Angeles, has developed a brochure that has several access points with a map. It's called Owens Lake Trails. Um, and uh, there are th three places where people can v enter the lake easily with an information mm -hmm. kiosk and get the map and read about the lake. Um, uh, all of the lake is, is worth visiting. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the northern area of the lake, be closest to the river, because the uh, habitat is particularly good in there. I think the soils aren't quite as salty. The water coming in from the aqueduct um, creates a nice um, kind of brackish system, ecosystem, and uh, there's just consistently tons of birds there. It, it does the birds do thin out in the summertime and in the dead of winter, but spring and fall, uh, they're just massive amounts of birds. Eastern Sea Area Interpretive Association, and we have our campfire program series continuing through the summer. Our next campfire program is going to be Saturday, July 30th, at the Inyo National Forest Shady Rest Campground in Mammoth Lakes. The program is going to be covering black bears, and the program starts at 7 o'clock p.m and it will be free to the public. Again, this program is sponsored by LADWP and Wild Tribute, and it'll be Saturday, July 30th at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Shady Rest Campground in Mammoth Lakes. This is Jeff Gabriel with the Eastern Seer Interpretive Association. Educate, inspire, explore. Hi, Chris Langley here, and I have a really wonderful guest who has been here in uh, Bishop and in Yo County for seven years, he just told me. And I always wanted to be a newspaper man, although I didn't have a suit and I didn't change into it in a telephone booth. He does. So he's going to be really fun to talk to. And we're going to find out what really goes on in his office besides the cooler not working. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so we have uh, Terrence Vestal here. And he's going to tell us everything he knows about making papers three days a week or five days a week or seven days a week or whatever he has to do. And he's been in it since a sophomore uh, yeah. in high school to jur journalism. Yeah, Chris, I uh, started at my high school newspaper. Um, I, my love of language started way before that. Uh, my uh, mom was a kindergarten teacher, so I was reading before I was walking. But um, I got into uh, newspapers in high school, and then I went to... Uh, what was the I, name of your high school paper? The, the Stampede. Over, um, and, it was the, and where, what, where the, was the, the Burgess Mustangs. Oh. So, so it was the Stampede. I actually have a, uh, one of my high school articles hanging on uh, the, the wall of my, uh, uh, my apartment. Uh, I did a story. Uh, it was in... It was my senior year, and you know Bobby Fuller, the Bobby Fuller Four. I fought the law, and the law won. Oh yes. And, well, it's Bobby, before my time, but yeah. Well, Bobby Fuller actually went to Burgess High School for a couple of years, 
uh, he didn't graduate there, but um, I was uh, I was in my journalism class, and I had a substitute teacher. The teacher actually, the regular teacher, had gone on maternity leave, um, and the substitute teacher was actually a reporter from the El Paso Times wow. in that newspaper. And he said, you know, if I was working for a student newspaper at Burgess High School, I'd jump on this Bobby Fuller story. Um, his name was Peter Stevenson, and um, we would we went to Can Uteo and we talked to uh, uh, Bobby Fuller's former drummer um, and the radio stations. And I wrote up this real nice. And he died very mysteriously. They chalked oh. it up to suicide in Los Angeles. They found his body beat up and and. Uh, you know, it was he yeah, beat himself? Up? Exactly, exactly, and he and it was very mysterious, and and the the band was paranoid, and and but it turned out to be this full page spread. I got some old pictures from the band, and I talked to like the radio DJs who were DJs at the time that Bobby Fuller was there, and so it turned out to be a really nice package, and that really just sort of said, okay, this is I could really get into this kind of thing, and then I went to uh, New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, I did serve six years in the Army National Guard and Army uh, Army Reserve and National Guard while I was doing that. I was a small arms specialist. I worked on weapons, um, but I went to uh, uh, New Mexico State University and I started working for the uh, Las Cruces Sun News while I was going to school. Tuition was getting expensive, and I ended up uh, dropping out of New Mexico State University actually before I got my degree. Um, but I was already working for the Las Cruces Sun News, and I stayed on, and I started getting much more involved, and I started covering city government and uh, uh, police and courts. And back then, this is in the early 90s when there were still trials, even in smaller communities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there weren't as many uh, plea deals and all of that. But... Las Cruces Sun News is a major metro newspaper, and I immediately was aware of the disconnect that I felt between the people I, I was writing for, my audience. And about that time, um, the Taos News in Taos, New Mexico, small community, called me up, northern New Mexico, just practically on the other edge of the state, and said, hey, Terrence, how would you like to come up in Taos? And that was my first introduction to small community newspapers, <clears throat> and I've loved them ever since. And pretty much has that been your career working with yeah, small? How small. many papers do you think you've worked for? A dozen, I would say. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, most most of them in New Mexico. A couple of them in Colorado, and uh, one in Kansas, Garden City, Kansas. Uh, it's called Garden City, Kansas, I think, because Slaughterhouse City wouldn't doesn't sound as nice. But there's more slaughterhouses in Garden City, Kansas, than there are. Gardens. I'm not trying to disparage Garden City. Well, I hope not. <laughs> um, so we will return next time and talk more about the future of journalism, the future of papers on paper and electronic and all the, that kind of stuff, and the that challenges sure. of working with a small paper in a reasonably small community. You can tell that story. What? <laughs> Reagan. Oh. <laughs> you know, we, uh, he put off getting a popcorn machine or a candy counter because back in those days there was loyalty on the main street. And the man across the street sold candy and all that. And so they said, why don't you put candy and concessions in here? He said, no, Lou Gehrig does the candy. I'm not going to worry about that. But he finally did give in to a popcorn machine. And so we got a popcorn machine, and uh, I got to learn how to use it and made really good popcorn. But one night uh, after, you know, everything got settled and got looking good up there, uh, Ronald Reagan and Jane Wyman came in, and that's when they were having their troubles with their marriage, and they were trying to, I guess, patch it up. But anyway, and so I looked up, and there was Ronald Reagan, and I thought, my God, that's Ronald Reagan. I, just so, so, I was so starstruck. And then Jane Wyman, and he, 
And so he said, you got popcorn? I said, oh yeah, we got popcorn. And I put the popcorn in there for him. And then, I, and then he went upstairs at the loge. And so I ran up to tell my mom, I said, you know who's up here? And she says, well, no, who? I said, that was Jane Wyman and Ronald Reagan. Oh, well, I just asked him to take their popcorn off the ledge so it wouldn't fall down on the feet. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jeff Gabriel with the Eastern Syria Interpretive Association, and we have our campfire program series continuing through the summer. Our next campfire program is going to be Saturday, July 30th at the Inyo National Forest Shady Rest Campground in Mammoth Lakes. The program is going to be covering black bears, and the program starts at 7 o'clock p.m., and it will be free to the public. Again, this program is sponsored by... LADWP and Wild Tribute, and it'll be Saturday, July 30th at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Shady Rest Campground in Mammoth Lakes. This is Jeff Gabriel with the Eastern Seer Interpretive Association. Educate, inspire, explore. <laughs> Fred Rowe from Sierra Bright Dot Fly Fishing Guide Service. I've been teaching, guiding, writing, and lecturing on fly fishing in the Eastern Sierra since 1982. Well, let's get to this week's fish report. Well, the upper Owens, things are starting to shape up good. We're starting to see a few hoppers here and there, but the hatch really isn't out yet. And what we're really seeing is insects like PMD mayflies and caddis flies hatching. And we're doing okay with the dry flies, but it's really nymph fishing that we're doing up there. And what we're catching are what we call pan-sized fish. Those are your eight to 12 inch rainbows and browns. Well, let's kick on over to Hot Creek. Hot Creek, still kind of messed up and weird, but the um, trico hatch in the morning is what's producing for us, particularly in the turpative side. Then the caddis come out, but the fish really aren't necessarily feeding on them consistently. Sometimes they'll take them, some days they won't. Down in the canyon section, we're still doing mostly nymph fishing down there. Okay, over at Crawley Lake, things are stabilizing, but the fish have moved out to deep water. Most of the boats are all in one area, but for a few guys, they're finding spots out by themselves and doing a lot better because they're reducing the fishing pressure. Same thing out there. Work three inches off the bottom to three feet off the bottom. Change that as the light in the day progresses. And same fly patterns. We're using uh, black and copper and the black and silver midges along with gray and then the albino baron. Okay. Um, let's kind of head into the canyons and the creeks. Um, the Rock Creek and Bishop Creek are both fishing good. They're starting to get a little less water in them, so you got to really be careful how you approach those creeks. And they're fishing great with dries and droppers. And I like using Adam's Parachute and Gold Red Pears Ears on both those creeks. All right, let's head on down the hill. Lower Owens, man, by noon you want to be off the water. But during the morning, there's a great nymphing opportunities, and if we're lucky, there's a little bit of hatch stuff going on. And it's primarily little yellow stones, PMDs, and caddis. All right, and then we'll wrap up with my favorite Bishop Creek Canal. And we're doing great using the Euro nymph stuff over there, or indicator and nymph. It. And the primary flies are um, beadhead flashback cold ripped hairs ears or pheasant tails. Well, that's this week's fly fishing report brought to you by Sierra Bright Dot, Fly Fishing Guide Service, and I can be found on Instagram or Facebook or on my webpage at sierrabrightdot.com.